Okay, good morning, or this afternoon, I guess, right now. Uh, welcome to today's sustainability seminar. My name is Nancy Holm. I think most of you know me. Assistant Director here and seminar organizer, along with Beth Lubert. And I want to remind uh, everyone in the audience here to please turn your cell phones off or to vibrate. And then also, I'd like to request that all the questions uh, be kept to the end of the seminar today. Um, and then we will pass the microphone around for you to ask your question. And for those viewing online, uh, you may type your questions in at any time, but we'll answer those at the end as well. So the seminar um, is being archived, as are all of our sustainability seminars. So we have about 90 of those up online uh, on our website. And uh, this one will be archived and be available next week uh, on the website. Uh, the schedule for all the other seminars is available here on the table outside. And for those online, you can look on our website to see the events coming up in the next uh, several months. Uh, today, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce Erin Jones, who will be joining us from Chicago. Erin um, is a consultant with SR4 Partners, a privately held management consulting company, where she's worked since January 2010. Uh, prior to that, she was an environmental protection specialist uh, with the US EPA Protection Agency, and she developed region-wide education for air and radiation division, including organizing and staffing community outreach events. Um, prior to that, she was an environmental scientist uh, for the Land and Chemicals Division, Materials Management Branch, and coordinated uh, with tribal programs to develop a database for tracking solid waste grants, resulting in increased communication and accountability in the U.S. government tribal relations. Uh, she also worked uh, in the Land and Chemical Division on uh, RECRA uh, correction actions. And then uh, another uh, position she held was to be the project coordinator for the Audubon uh, Chicago region. So she's had quite a diverse background with environmental issues, and we're pleased to have her today to talk about uh, facilitating employee engagement in sustainability uh, initiatives. So Erin, I'm going to turn it over to you as presenter. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for having me. It, uh, as you read that, Nancy, I forgot that I did all those things uh, back in another life because of the life I've been living for the past four years. So um, uh, my name is Erin Jones, and I'm a consultant at a change management company based in Chicago called SR4 Partners. And we really see um, our job and our role um, is really helping people uh, within organizations to embrace something new or different. So for me, this is really what engagement is all about, right? So when we think about getting people engaged, we're asking them to change their behaviors. Um, we're asking them to do something differently. And when we talk about this in terms of sustainability initiatives, right, we're really asking people to do something different. We're asking them to recycle. We're asking them to turn off their lights. We're asking them to get rid of their desktop printers, uh, we're asking them, you know, to wear a sweater, we're asking them to adjust to a different temperature, all of these different things um, is what we're really asking people to do when we think about sustainability initiatives and getting people engaged in these. So um, today, uh, for the next 45 minutes or so, I really want us just to spend some time discussing how we get people engaged and how we get people to embrace something new or different. So uh, just a few objectives for us for our time together uh, that I think we'll walk through. Uh, the first one is consider how to start a movement. Uh, then we'll talk about this, reviewing this concept of crossing the chasm between the few and the many. So anytime we have an initiative, right, um, there's somebody who's kind of the owner of it or who's the leader of it or who had the idea. And the, the engagement comes from kind of transferring that ownership of that idea from that one individual or small group of people over to, you know, everybody else who you're trying to get engaged in the effort. Um, so within our company, we've got a model that we like to talk people through on this um, and that we use in our business every day in which we find really successful in getting people um, engaged not only in sustainability initiatives but initiatives throughout organizations. 
Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about the critical importance of utilizing a network-based approach. Uh, over our, um, in our experience and all the work that we've done, we've really found that this engagement piece uh, typically happens along uh, these social lines, not organi organizational lines. So we want to talk a little bit about having that network-based uh, mindset. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about the role of program sponsorship and how important that is. Um, it's a little bit of kind of change management language is that program sponsor um, language, but there's just a few critical things that, you know, the person who's kind of leading the initiative um, needs to do and a few things that they shouldn't do um, in order to um, demonstrate kind of the, the importance of their role and to make sure, contribute to the success of the initiative. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about customizing why messages and how you might inspire people. And then um, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about the importance of small beginnings and not waiting for, you know, that big grandiose change, but instead uh, paying attention to the little things that are happening along the way. So um, to get started, I thought we would just take a look at a video. Uh, this video, the quality of the video to start isn't that great, but uh, I think you can still get the, the point of it. Um, and the approach of it, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, what the video is demonstrating after uh, it's over. Okay, let's take a look. So ladies and gentlemen, at TED we talk a lot about leadership and how to make a movement. So let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons from it. First, of course you know, a leader needs the guts to stand out and be ridiculed. <laughs> but what he's doing is so easy to follow. So here's his first follower with a crucial role. He's going to show everyone else how to follow. Now notice that the leader embraces him as an equal. So now it's not about the leader anymore, it's about them, plural. Now there he is calling to his friends. Now if you notice that the first follower is actually an underestimated form of leadership in itself. It takes guts to stand out like that. The first follower is what transforms a lone nut into a leader. <laughs> and here comes a second follower. Now it's not a lone nut, it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. So a movement must be public. It's important to show not just the leader, but the followers, because you find that new followers emulate the followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, and immediately after, three more people. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point. Now we've got a movement. <laughs> so notice that as more people join in, it's less risky. So those that were sitting on the fence before now have no reason not to. They won't stand out. They won't be ridiculed but they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. So, <laughs> over the next minute, you'll see all of the uh, those that prefer to stick with the crowd because eventually they would be ridiculed for not joining in. And that's how you make a movement. But let's recap some lessons from this. So, first, if you are the type, like the shirtless dancing guy, that is standing alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals. So it's clearly about the movement, not you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but we might have missed the real lesson here. The biggest lesson, if you noticed, did you catch it? Is that leadership is over-glorified. That yes, it was the shirtless guy was first, and he'll get all the credit, but it was really the first follower that transformed the lone nut into a leader. So as we're told that we should all be leaders, that would be really ineffective. If you really care about starting a movement, have the courage to follow and show others how to follow. And when you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first one to stand up and join in. And what a perfect place to do that, the TED. Thanks. So um, 
So I really love this concept of when we think about engagement, not just thinking about engagement, but thinking about um, how do you start a movement, right? What does it take um, in order to get a great number of people uh, to get engaged and get excited and to talk about things and to change their behavior and do all these things? And so um, although organizations, right, in the places where we work every day or where we live every day are more complicated than some crazy people dancing on a hill, um, I think there's a few points here that we really like to make um, uh, as far as kind of the mindset that we go into when we think about getting people engaged, right? Um, there's that, that first piece, which is if you're kind of in that leadership role, right, is that you have to have the courage to stand out. So if you don't have the courage to do something differently um, or, you know, to stand out or kind of be alone there for a little bit until your first followers join you, it's going to be challenging to get people really engaged in what you're working through. Uh, the second piece is uh, really that these first follow followers are an underestimated form of leadership. And this is, um, I think this is a critical piece, and we'll go into this a little bit more in the next slide, but, you know, the, these first followers are just, um, they're people who are excited about whatever the initiative is. So uh, first followers can come from unexpected places, uh, but they're really critical to the success of engagement, um, to engagement in an initiative. Right, and so these first followers, just remembering that they're an underestimated form of leadership, is a, is a critical piece. Um, also, we also think it's important to point out that once you have the leader, right, and then you've got your group of first follow followers, eventually people can't see who the leader is anymore, right? And so they're emulating those first followers, not the leader. And so you have to nurture those first followers kind of as equals, right? Um, you have to nurture them in a way that they feel like they can lead others um, because those emulators, you know, as you're going up and you're scaling up the engagement, uh, they're not going to always be able to just emulate the leader anymore, but instead emulate those first followers. So that's a little bit of jargon, but I think this next slide here will help break this down just a little bit. So um, when we think about um, kind of this is, this is a model of a condition that we see in organizations over and over again, right? And it's all this, uh, this concept of the few and the many. And you can think about this for a whole organization or just part of an organization, right? So you can think about this within a department or within a giant you know, within a huge, you know, thousands and thousands of people. Um, and basically what we see all the time, I'm going to take a few minutes just to walk through this model, right, is we can begin with, um, we've got the few and the many, and I'm going to start on the few side here, right? So on the few side we have the intender, right? And the intender is kind of that um, sponsor or that initial leader, the person who has the idea, the concept, the initiative that they want to move forward with right? Um, they're the ones who maybe their job tells them that they need to be responsible for this, or maybe um, they just want to lead, they want to lead with this idea, that sort of thing, right? So you've got the intender, um, and then you've got this small group of people, we call them the inner circle sometimes, um, where you've got this small group of people that the intender spends a lot of time talking to, right? These are the people who go into the meetings to say, what's the initiative going to be? How are we going to roll it out? What's it going to look like? What are the initiatives, right? These are the people who get to spend all the time deciding um, what's going to be done, right? So they get a lot of context because their jobs or um, their responsibilities indicate that they get to spend time, you know, day in, day out, sometimes weeks, sometimes months, sometimes years thinking about and developing um, this initiative. So over that time, they're able to really develop a high context um, for what the initiative is. And then on the other side of this chasm, right, on the many side of the chasm, we break down um, the people or the experience of some people into those first followers, like we saw in the movie, as well as the emulators. So the first followers, right, that's the underestimated form of leadership. And those first followers, uh, for any type of initiative, they come from surprising places. And figuring out who those first followers are is really a critical step. Right, first followers um, aren't always exactly what you expect or where you might expect them to be, and you might not always have visibility to who all the possible first followers are. So uh, spending time to say, what do we want here, um, as far as our first followers go, is kind of is it is an important piece and is important to think about. Um, 
the, the fact that over time, these first followers, when you identify them, they can pe be people with varying tenures, um, varying levels within an organization, and it's important for them to be from a diverse, um, diverse departments, diverse um, places within the organization, because you're likely to find those first followers over throughout the organization, and if you just um, focus on, you know, like one specific section or one specific department, what you'll find is increased engagement in that department, but not increased engagement um, across departments. So just something to think about there. And then lastly, you have the emulators. So the emulators are the people who have got the lowest context, right? It's not their job to think about the sustainability initiatives. Um, they're paying attention to other things. They're just as busy as everybody else. But for whatever reason, um, they're just not they're not in close contact with the intender, right? So their network or the leaders that they're going to be looking to are the first followers. So when we go back to the video and we think about um, first followers being an underestimated form of leadership, um, we end up with thinking about kind of those emulators being ready to follow those first followers but not the intender. So. Um, these folks, you know, on the many side of the chasm, they've got a lower context for everything uh, because they just don't have the time to spend um, thinking about and developing the initiative. They don't have visibility to it. Um, but what's really important about them, right, is that they determine the degree to which uh, people will get engaged in the initiative, right? It's up to the people on this side of the chasm to say, to what extent are we going to adopt or change our behaviors um, in line with what the intender and the inner circle are asking us to do. And so this kind of breakdown of, you know, this experience within an organization helps us understand where we need to spend our time and where we need to perhaps um, um, shift our attention when we're trying to increase engagement in sustainability initiatives, right? So what we see all the time is the intender and the in inner circle spend months, weeks, years, right, developing an initiative, developing a concept, uh, they schedule a meeting, uh, they schedule a rollout plan, and they roll it out to everybody with great fanfare, and then they say, man, why didn't anybody do anything differently? And what we have found is typically this is a context problem. This is um, an experience of the fact that the first followers and the emulators uh, just don't have the context that they need to understand why the initiative is important, why they should be taking it on, uh, why they should be adopting their, changing their behaviors and their habits. Um, they just don't have the context because you release it, you know, one time, you give them that information, and so they go back to work you know, doing the same things that they always do rather than um, trying to figure out how they might change their behaviors. So this model has been really helpful for us as we think about kind of the role of different people. And so what we really like to circle in on and where we spend um, our days and our weeks and all of our time is really with this group of first followers and leveraging the first followers and their personal social networks in order to increase engagement. So when we think about first followers and when we think about kind of that model that we just went through, we really think that it's critical for people to spend their time with first followers. Um, and really to, uh, as you, you know, initially engaging them, um, getting buy-in from those first followers, and then post rollout of an, an initiative, uh, providing those first followers um, a charge, giving them an assignment, right, asking them to push the new behaviors or the initiative to the depth of their social networks, um, to educate their social networks, um, to give the first followers permission to do this, to push the information, to share, to engage their social networks, and to really provide these first followers with the tools that they need in order to um, empower their social networks to be able to make these changes. So a great example of this, um, I think, is uh, an example of what a gentleman by the name of Aaron Dernbaugh did at Loyola University in Chicago. So Aaron was uh, hired to a new job to be a sustainability director um, at Loyola University, and his first job, right, at Loyola was to develop their sustainability plan. So we've seen lots and lots and lots of people develop sustainability plans by sitting in an office, going through the different departments and the different functions and processes within an organization, right? Um, 
figuring out what they need to do differently, submitting the report, saying here's what you all have to do differently, and then people adopting or agreeing or disagreeing with that to varying degrees. Instead, what um, Aaron was able to do was he was able to spend some time um, thinking about who might my first followers be, right? Who are the people and the parties that I need to engage with early on in this process and get them enrolled to understand what, what's important to them as far as sustainability initiatives go um, and what might we incorporate into the sustainability plan that they would be excited about. So um, he was able to talk to people in admissions, you know, he even went out and had these sessions with the neighboring community based on, you know, just the, the impact that the uh, community on the north side of Chicago has on Loyola to say what should be included in our sustainability plan and really spend a lot of time with these people who um, were excited about the fact that there was a sustainability plan coming out and spending time getting input for, with them and from them uh, initially and early on. So by the time that the, the plan was rolled out and people were expected to change their behavior and change their initiatives, they really um, were already bought into the process. So I really think that this is a good example of uh, finding those first followers, right, and getting them engaged early on so that by the time the plan was able to roll out, um, they already had a lot of context, right? He had already helped them understand what they were trying to achieve, what the plan was going to look like. They could see their words and their wants and their desires into the plan so that they then could um, push those plans out to their different uh, departments and their different networks in order to achieve increased, um, increased success with it. So um, spending lots of time with those first followers is just um, a really critical piece that we found um, over time. And it leads really nicely into the ask, right? So the ask with your first followers is push, uh, push the, uh, the ask of the initiative or the work to the depth of your personal social network. And the reason, right, or the social science behind why this network-based approach is so important and why we ask those first followers, right, um, to take on these roles or to do these things um, when we're talking about getting more people engaged um, really comes from um, some research. This is just one example. There's more, but a, a Harvard social scientist by the name of Nicholas Christakis who uh, has written a few different books, but one that I like to talk about is um, a book called Connected, How Your Friends, Friends, Friends Affect Everything You Feel, Think, and Do. So, um, so Dr. Christakis um, and some other researchers really have been able to find that, you know, and talk about how relationships um, allow us to influence and be influenced by others. So when we think about engagement, right, we want to think about it as a social contagion. If I've got a coworker or a colleague or a friend, you know, at work who's engaged in or very excited about um, the fact that they're now wearing sweaters to work to stay warm um, because the temperatures are being adjusted to be more sustainable or um, a friend who is excited that there's new, you know, LED lights that are requiring less energy to, uh, to light our space even though the color and the quality of the lighting is different or more people using, um, you know, water bottles that are reusable. Whatever it is, the fact that Dr. Christakis has found, has found that if your friends are doing it, right, the relationships, the people you work with are doing it, you are more likely to do it as well. So the, the research that they published that was the most popular and was initially published actually had to do with um, obesity, but they've been able to prove this fact now in regards to our ideas, our behaviors, and our emotional states. And what they've been able to prove is that we can influence or be influenced up to three degrees of separation. So in their obesity research, they found that um, if somebody is obese, right, or has a friend who's a obese or a family member or somebody close in their social network, you um, personally are 57% more likely to be obese. So uh, the, the numbers held true also for smoking as well. Um, that, so 
at that first degree of separation, um, an idea, a behavior, an emotional state, whatever it is, if a friend or somebody in your personal social network is demonstrating that behavior, then you personally are 57% more likely to demonstrate that behavior or that condition. At the second degree of separation, it's still like 17% more likely. So um, when your friend's friend is doing something, you're still 17% more likely to do it. And even when your friend's friend's friend is doing something, so the third degree of separation, uh, it's still 11% more likely. And so when we think about taking this network-based approach and asking people to push kind of this engagement on an initiative to the depth of their own personal social network, this is the science that supports that this is important, right? The relationships we have allow us to influence as well as be influenced by others. So when we think about maximizing engagement via these relationship channels, um, we can start to understand how we might uh, get more people engaged in in these sustainability initiatives, right? You've got your first follower who for some reason is excited about it already, and then we're asking them to push that excitement and engagement to the depth of their pre-existing social networks. Another kind of interesting piece here that um, they talk about is uh, the average size of a close social network. So um, on average, they found if you ask people this question, they say at any given time, somebody would list like five or six people, right, that they interact with on a daily basis with, they talk to, um, that they kind of think about um, as their, you know, own personal social network. And so, because of this third degree of separation piece, right, what they've been able to find is we're all kind of these overlapping squads of 150 people, right, five times five times five or five or six times, you know, over and over to the third power, you, you, you get to this number of about 150. And what I like and why I share this number, right, about the third degree is it helps you to understand how many first followers you might need um, depending on the size of your organization. So um, if you're an organization of 150 people, maybe you're looking at five or six first followers from across the organization to help um, you figure out how many different people you need to um, to help push engagement to a diverse group of people. Uh, but if you're a much larger organization, then you're going to have to identify and engage um, and empower a lot more first followers. So. I hope that's holding together for folks. Um, if there's any questions on that, we can talk about it um, towards the end here. But I just think it's a, an interesting thing uh, to be able to kind of quantify how many first followers do I need to engage and empower in order to increase engagement significantly. A couple of other pieces here on the network-based um, approach versus a traditional approach. So I think this is uh, how we adopt kind of this change in mindset around increasing engagement. Um, so typically what we found in organizations, and this is, you know, changing now more and more as we um, see people caring and showing the effects of organizational health more and more, but typically, right, you've got really the centralized decision making. Somebody decides there's going to be an initiative or a change, they make that decision and they push that decision out to everybody else. Uh, you find more focus on individual efforts um, rather than the connections among people. Um, you're talking about procuring programs and deliverables in a traditional approach. You're um, talking about firmly controlled um, and planned process, right? So you know exactly what you're going to do. You say, we're going to think about the initiative, we're going to launch it, here are the things we're going to support, rather than being prepared for the emergent needs that might come up. Um, you also talk about the, your effectiveness really being linked to concrete outputs of some sort. And then ownership being limited by area of expertise, right? So the owners um, fall only within the organizational department or something like that um, versus looking at the network of the organization and being able to leverage some of those first followers versus the network-based approach, right, where you see a lot of decentralized decision-making. So you've got the intender in their inner circle, but you help to decentralize uh, the, the decision-making through those first followers uh, as well as their social networks, right? So people feel empowered to start adopting the change and changing their behavior in a way that they see fit or that works for them um, within their daily life. 
Um, you see the focus is really on those connections forged between individuals and the building of networks. So the idea here, right, is um, if we think about, um, uh, let's see, if we think about an initiative that has to do with um, with uh, reducing the number of water bottles, uh, disposable water bottles that are being used, what we're, he what we're seeing now isn't um, the focus just on that output, right, of getting the number of water bottles decreased, but what we're focusing on is kind of those relationships and those connections that your first followers are making among their social networks. So the conversations that they're having um, in their social networks about, you know, the effects of those water bottles, um, the alternative behaviors that people could demonstrate and said to reduce those sorts of things, uh, and, and watching the connections forged and watching the change in behaviors among those networks more so than um, just saying, having one person say, change this or do this differently. Um, we want to see kind of the stimulating activity among the networks, so the conversations, the engagement among the networks, um, opening, open information sharing and emergent learning, so um, finding, you know, along the way, expecting to hear back from some of those networks and those first followers about things that are working and aren't. Um, and then really building that trust and that ownership and ex expertise just being distributed across multiple areas um, so that all of a sudden you're willing to hear from, you know, your operations department or your administrative assistants um, on these topics and not just willing to, willing to hear from, you know, the sustainability experts in the area. So that network-based approach and um, helping those uh, first followers understand that network-based approach in your ask and kind of their roles, um, we found to critically help engagement um, in, in initiatives because, you know, people, people want to follow their peers and they, and they influence their peers and can be influenced by their peers. And so having this network-based approach is complementary um, to what the social science is showing us. All right, so the next topic I wanted to talk about is sponsorship, right? So when you have this change initiative, sometimes you've got um, a leader, right, who really wants to have their hands um, on the topic and they're really involved, and other times you don't. And I think um, what you often find as a practitioner is what what what's your ask from the person who's the sponsor or the leader, right? Um, and what do you want them not to do? And so. There's an organization out there called ProSci, which is a group of change management researchers. And uh, they did a study in 2013, and they do, a, they do studies on a regular basis, um, basically around what, it, what are the things that, that um, help with successful change and engagement efforts versus what are the things that get in the way of them. And they found that the number one contributor to successful change is active and visible participant. Uh, sorry, active and visible sponsorship. So making sure that that one person who's the sponsor um, overall, that they are unwavering in their commitment to the rollout of this initiative. And that that unwavering commitment can really help with the engagement piece. So um, their 2013 study had 822 participants from across 63 different countries. Um, and they really found that this number one contributor right, was um, this active and visible sponsorship. So by the active and visible sponsorship, they mean three things, right? Participate actively and visibly throughout the project. So um, making sure that that sponsor is there, working with the inner circle, spending time with those first followers as well, um, engaging, asking questions. Um, building a coalition of sponsorship and managing resistance. So when we think about those sponsorship roles, um, they need to help with the building that coalition of sponsorship um, across a diverse, you know, group of you business units or you know university units, whatever it might be, um, and then also that making sure that they're communicating directly with employees on the topic. So when we think about um, participating actively and visibly throughout the project, we think about allocating the necessary resources and funding, setting expectations, and establishing clear objectives for the project, um, holding the team accountable for results, attending frequent project review meetings and actively reviewing the progress. I think that that's an important one that the sponsorship, you know, they might not be the practitioner or the person who's really doing the day-to-day -day work, but that they come into those sessions and are close along the way as a way to demonstrate 
um, that sponsorship as well. Um, and then just making sure that sometimes if there are other things on their calendars, um, that they clear those calendars in order to really show that this is a priority. Um, demonstrating that priority among the first followers, among the inner circle, really pays off um, as you start to, to push this information and the initiative out to the networks because they're able to say this leader within the organization um, is really actively engaged in this and this is what they want, that sort of thing. Uh, then uh, building a coalition of sponsorship and managing resistance really includes things like building a strong sponsor coalition um, among the different departments and leaders and different stakeholders, determining and communicating priorities between, you know, this initiative and other initiatives and helping people understand, you know, how this one initiative might uh, contribute to the greater, um, to the greater, you know, strategic pillars of the organization or strategic plans of the organization. So helping to build that um, coalition, um, really ensuring consistent messaging um, is being communicated with these different managers, um, the different people who needed to be communicated with, um, and then really recognizing these outstanding people as well starts happening here, right? So when people are really doing a great job um, among that coalition of sponsorship, um, recognizing it and acknowledging it so that other people will follow along the way. And then communicating directly with employees is just also an important piece here, right? So as far as that sponsor role goes, making sure that the sponsor's taking time in whatever different venues that they have, be it, you know, speeches or newsletters or email or whatever it might be, that they're communicating with people directly on an initiative. Um, this will help engagement, you know, to varying degrees. Some people care a ton about what their sponsor is doing. Other people may be le less so. Um, but when a sponsorship's engage a sponsor's engagement wavers, then of course everybody else's engagement is going to waver also. And so, um, really communicating directly with employees helps um, us to understand that. Um, that you know, the employees understand that the sponsor is committed to this, um, it's important, and it signals to them that maybe they should be paying attention to. Um, so some of the things you can communicate on that are important, right? So communicating really builds that awareness um, that there's going to be something new and then different for people to um, embrace. Um, showing how this change kind of aligns with the overall direction of the organization. Uh, sharing goals and expectations for the project, um, celebrating the successes of it with people, um, listening to people and getting feedback on it, um, and really this part is really important, is being willing to communicate with people the same information multiple times. Uh, what we find often is um, people in sponsorship roles have that high, high context, so they think, I've already told you this, why do you need to hear it again? Or I've already said that to them. I don't want to say it to them again. And what we found is that this um, willingness to communicate things over and over is really important because um, people don't always get it the first time. And so a sponsor that's willing to communicate um, a message repeatedly is really an important role. And then I really like this just um, short list of five common mistakes made by sponsors. Um, which is just really the inverse of the things that we just talked about, but I think it's um, nice to talk just to review quickly. Um, so when they talk about sponsors not fulfilling their role or the what they might be doing that's prohibiting the success of an initiative, they talk about um, failing to personally engage in the project, so they just don't care about it, so they don't show up for things, um, they're not talking about it, that sort of thing. Avoided direct communications with employees, so didn't talk about the initiative with employees. Um, delegated his or her sponsorship role, so uh, we find oftentimes sponsors will be really excited at the beginning and then their um, engagement wavers over time and then of course everyone else's does too, so um, making sure that a sponsor doesn't want to, won't delegate their role to somebody else, um, just that wavering in the support of it and then really failing to build that coalition of sponsorship with key leaders in the organization. So that role of that sponsor, right, is to get their peers to say, yep, this is just as important too, and when people in my department are asking me about it, I'm going to be supportive about it, I'm going to be educated on it, um, and I'm going to say, yep, this is a priority of ours. So um, that sponsorship role is really important, and I um, 
I love this because it just breaks it down so simply into what you're asking for from your sponsors um, as well as what you're not asking for from them. Okay, so then the next topic um, just to talk about as far as engagement goes, um, I think I'll start with a story on this one. So um, there's a, a community college called Beta Knock Community College um, in Escanaba, Michigan, and they were trying to put together, you know, their different sustainability initiatives. Um, and community colleges are just really an uh, interesting piece um, I think because they just connect businesses in the community so closely with, um, you know, the community college kind of aspect. And so I think that this one is just really an interesting thing to think about. So when the community college was trying to figure out why do people care about sustainability initiatives in our community, right? Why do people care about, um, you know, the health of our uh, environment, right? Why do they care about this stuff here in Escanaba? And what they were able to find over time through conversations and discussions with people is that one thing that was really important to um, that community was the return of a bird called the purple martin. So each spring or towards the end of the winter when the purple martins returned, the community got excited. Escanaba is north right? It's cold. When it is, uh, when spring is coming, people are excited. And so all of their sustainability initiatives eventually were really tied to the Purple Martins and the importance of the Purple Martins in their town. And this why message really started to inspire people more and more um, versus just the generic um, you know, greening or save our environment language, for them what was important was the story of the Purple Martins and what that signified for their community. So um, I think this is a great example of what um, the author Simon Shinnick and in his book Start With Why, How Great Leaders Inspire Everyone to Take Action um, is talking about in his work. And if you're not familiar with his work, there's um, a bunch of TED Talks and things like that. You can just Google it and it will show up right away. Um, but he basically has this concept of a golden circle, right? That we all have to say, if we communicate in this order of first talking about why, then talking about how, then talking about what, that we are much more inspiring um, and inspire people to take action if, than if we talk about um, things the way that we normally do, which is talking about um, in the exact opposite order, which is what, how, why. Um, so, so this concept that you can catch up on if, you, if you're not familiar with it is really starting with why and helping people discover um, why they exist, right, or what, why things are important to them. And so I, what I found over time is that in, um, in the world of sustainability, um, for a long time, right, uh, coming out of like the 1970s and the environmental movement of the 70s, we all just said save the earth and save the planet. And as depressing as it may be, not everyone cares about saving the earth and saving the planet. So when we think about getting people engaged and getting a great number of people engaged in these um, initiatives, I think it's really important to think about the customization of the why messages. So some people might be totally on board with save the planet, save the earth. It's likely what the folks who um, are leading sustainability departments are excited about and what they'll talk about all the time, but it's not that exciting and important to everybody. So I think communicating and figuring out what that why is that's important, as they did at Beta Not Community College and in that community, I think it's really important. Some people care about saving money, right? Some people care about saving the earth. Some people might care about something else where you can still get them engaged in the sustainability initiatives. You just have to connect it to what's important to them and what they care about. And so um, we found that this um, thinking through and kind of segmenting um, your audience to determine the different why messages that might work is a really important piece and component um, to getting more and more people engaged in these sustainability initiatives. Okay, so then the, the last part that I just want to talk about here is really this idea of um, shining a light on a million small beginnings. So what we've 
what we like to remind people of is basically in the history of time, right, no meaningful or, you know, big or change has ever happened from one central force exacting their will or power on others, right? Instead, we see small changes over time. So one person or a small group of people first think to act in a new way, right? So you start seeing a couple of people changing things, right? And then over time, maybe more and more people are able to change things. And so um, I really think about, you know, when we're thinking about um, getting people engaged, there's this key component to celebrating the small wins to start to think small, um, to not wait for something big to happen, and to really take some ground level actions, and then to recognize people. That's the shine a light part, right? Um, stop waiting for something big to happen, but talk about the little things that you're seeing day in and day out among those networks where people are changing those things. So it might be using the water bottle example, right? You know, like Sarah can't bring her water bottle, her reusable water bottle every day, but she's now bringing it three days, right? And talking about that and saying that's okay, really helping people um, to understand how they can individually contribute to the change. So there's a um, couple examples of stories here, right, of these small beginnings um, are things like uh, there's a company called Canadian Pacific, which is a logistics and shipping company. and um, they wanted to implement a campaign to reduce the use of bottled water within their organization and just educate people more broadly on sustainability issues. So uh, they started just by launching some presentations and conducting some walkabouts for people to kind of be able to spot all the places where there was disposable water bottles being used. Um, and people started spotting them everywhere once they were looking for them. So they just started by raising the awareness. Um, and helping people to see them and look for them more often. And then they had some newsletters, and then they had, you know, some imagery that they used. But what they really did was they focused their efforts not on some big organizational, you know, huge change, but they really focused their efforts on how can we make an individual employee feel that they can contribute and make a difference. So they were spending time thinking about it at the individual le level um, and really encouraging and providing feedback. So their network of people, right, those first followers, their jobs were when you saw somebody doing something to talk about it. So, hey, nice reusable water bottle. Um, oh, did you think maybe you shouldn't use that disposable thing? You know, handing out cups, those sorts of things. Giving the people um, and using those first followers to recognize people for the small actions that they were taking on a daily basis. And over time, actually, at Canadian Pacific, they were able to reduce their bottled water use by 30%. Um, just making sure that they were thinking, you know, at that individual level of what they were going to be able to do. Um, the second example that I'll give real um, quickly here, you know, is just this idea. Um, it's a case study out of uh, SUNY Plattsburgh um, and a researcher by the name of Renee Bader um, that conducted a study in computer labs. And so her intention was to, to determine the best way to get people to turn off their monitors. And I love this example because I know that this is um, a question, right, that um, happens throughout organizations um, and businesses all the time as well is if you've got lots and lots of laptops um, within organizations, how do you get people to power them down? Should you automatically power them down at night? Um, or should we be helping people to change their behavior so that it might translate to their home, that sort of thing? So what they were able to do was they conducted the study in this lab and they initially just started by um, hanging little signs, little business cards on the, the front of computer screens that said, hey, when you're done, turn off the computer. And they saw some adoption of that behavior, but what they found more was when the behavior was demonstrated. So when a student or somebody arrived at a screen that was already turned off, then that in combination with the card as well um, greatly reduced um, how often the screens were left on over time. And so um, it was the combination of that visual cue plus the demonstration of the behavior applied together that drastically increased the percentage of students to turn off their monitors. And so I think that that's a nice example of a small beginning because it's something, you know, as little as the card plus the demonstration of the turn off plus somebody saying, hey, good job, way to turn it off, or reminding people of that, that all those things came together. 
So I think that those small beginnings um, are a nice example also of things to think about and to recognize and pay attention to. Um, there was another great example of, you know, desktop printers, I think is a great example of well, um, also of a small beginning where they were actually, an organization was actually able to um, link the removal of personal, you know, office-based desktop printers and go to centralized printing, um, and they connected it to personal health and well-being um, rather than connecting it to the environmental piece, which it has huge, you know, indoor air quality pieces, huge energy savings, um, but what inspired people was um, they were getting up to walk every day um, to those, and they were getting those extra steps in every day to walk to those places and, and the impacts that that has on your well-being versus um, the environmental impact of it, which, you know, the environmental impact of centralized printing is great, right? Reduce energy, less paper, all those different things. So um, finding a way to just have small ground-level beginnings and then shining a light on them, talking about them, recognizing them. Um, is really an incre important component to engagement um, for people. They need that feedback um, that says, hey, what I'm doing, people are recognizing and they're paying attention to. So um, those are all the, the topics that I wanted to cover today. Um, I hope it was helpful, and I think we can open up to questions. So um, with that, does anyone have any questions here in our audience? Uh, do we have any online levels? Oh, uh, yes, uh, Jennifer, let me come up here. How do you recommend um, making adjustments for changing populations, you know, overturn? In the examples of like college campuses, you have huge turnover of the population that you have to re-communicate the message to the new stakeholders um, at, even after you have adoption? Yeah, so um, one of the nice things, right, uh, your name's Jennifer, I think one of the key things as far as turnover goes is, um, so we, when you have like that kind of program sponsor role, one of the biggest misses in the traditional focus, right, or a traditional approach to engagement, um, you wouldn't account for that, the, those changes. But when you have this kind of network of people who are much closer to that change, um, I would probably spend time with my network um, helping them to, and my group of first followers saying, hey, when there is that turnover or when there is that change, here's the sort of information that we want to make sure we're catching people up on. Um, and I would probably spend a lot of time there with that group of people communicating that information and asking them to demonstrate that, that behavior um, more so than that sponsor role, because it's really hard for those sponsors and for those other people to want to say the same thing to groups over and over and over again. And so I, I think what I would probably do is take my um, first followers there and spend some time um, if, you know, that turnover is an important component or something that you're seeing that's um, uh, decreasing your engagement, empowering them with some tools to help overcome that. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Um, Aaron, I've actually got a couple of questions online, so okay. I'll just read the first one. Uh, how do you find supporters in a community that you've never been to? Yeah, so um, this is all kind of having this, that, that supporter, and how do you find the supporters in a community that you've never been to? I really think it's all about having um, this 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 mindset that you are you know if you're working on this this project and you're trying to get engaged that you're trying to be kind of in this connector role or this network re weaver role in that mindset so you know how do you find them you just have to start talking to people and say who's interested in this and who um, who wants to be involved in this sort of thing and just figure out, think about yourself as kind of building your own network and weaving that network. It's a little bit of detective work, I think, to figure out who those people might be. And I think having that um, mindset that you're a network builder or a network weaver um, and that you're doing that detective work is, is the only way that we've ever been able to do that. 
Um, that's my job all the time, right? So I work in consulting, we get a new project, and we have to kind of build a network around us to help people get uh, to embrace this new or different initiative. And the work that we do every single time that we do it is we figure out, okay, who are some of the people who could potentially be stakeholders are interested in this and we start having conversations and discussions with them to understand what they're excited about, what they're interested in, um, where they have energy, and if they know anybody else that we should be talking to. Um, I, I've actually got another question and this may, um, you may have answered part of this already, but okay. um, I'll read it. So how do you identify uh, which are your first followers? and create the motivation or initiative to take the first step? Yeah, so this is a really interesting piece and it's highly, highly variable. So depending on the initiative, right, um, and depending on what you're kind of talking about and the level of it, you have to do some work thinking, or thinking about what first followers should do, what their responsibilities are going to be, and who might be appropriate for that. The, the best guidance I can give, like for general overall first follower, um, first follower identification, is that within an organization or community or whatever it might be, that they have varying tenure, right? So that you're not looking at people who've all been there for 10 years or all been there for one year, but that they've got varying tenure and very varying knowledge of an organization. Um, the other part that I would say is that they're from diverse business units or departments. Um, so that you're trying to maximize the number of business units and departments that um, that you can that you that would be um, covered kind of through your first follower group, and then from there, depending on those initiatives, uh, whatever the initiative is, I would talk to people throughout those um, throughout those different kind of diverse places and see. One thing that we've done in the past, which is kind of funny. Uh, within organizations, a lot of times, you know, the sponsor doesn't have full visibility to the organization. So a team that I was working with this past year, in order to kind of form a f group of first followers, we had the sponsor identify five people um, that would that he thought were first followers for the initiative, and then we invited each of those first followers to bring a plus one with them. So somebody that they thought was a first follower also. Somebody that they thought was just excited, as excited or just as interested in the initiative as well. Um, because then it helped us, um, you know, within organizations make sure that uh, it wasn't being perceived as a favoritism type initiative as well as um, just provided us some, some visibility to places or things you see in an organization that um, you as the sponsor or, the, or whomever the sponsor is might not be able to see. Any other questions in the room? Okay, I think that's uh, the end of the questions here then. And so we really appreciate uh, your talk today, Aaron. And uh, for those watching online or here, we will have the uh, video archive on the website uh, later next week. So thank you very much. Thanks, Nancy. And if anybody has additional questions or anything like that about how this work goes, um, that's my email. So just send me a note. This is what I do day in, day out. And so um, I'm happy to answer any questions folks might have. And I hope it was um, in an informative and good use of an hour of your time today. So thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Erin. Take care. Bye.